All right, well, good morning. Hey, grab your Bibles. Turn to James chapter 5. I'll try and use whatever time Spencer left me. Um, man, I, I got like four or five points. I'll, maybe I'll just give you one. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, had the, uh, I had the opportunity this last week to um, play in a, in a golf event, as a fundraiser event, and something happened at that event, which I'm uh, kind of proud of. I was standing at my golf ball and waiting for the person behind me to hit. They were a good distance away from me, and they were hitting uh, the other direction. So, of course, I was in a safe spot. I was in a good place. And so I'm standing here, getting ready, watching this guy hit his golf ball. And I'm, I'm standing here, and there is a tree right here, like where this stand is. There's a tree right next to me. And I think to myself, you know, there's really no difference between me standing here and standing here, right? So I might as well stand right here, like right behind the tree, right? And you probably know where this is going. The guy lines up his swing, takes a shot, and the ball goes perfectly sideways and flies right past me. I'm not kidding. Like exactly where I was standing. And I said to myself, man, Jeremy, in your wisdom... You really saved yourself a lot of pain. And that's, that's kind of life, isn't it? That we, through wisdom, have the ability to save ourselves some pain in life, don't we? Save ourselves some grief based on uh, decisions, wise decisions or foolish decisions that we make. Um, James here is talking this morning about patience. Um, We'll we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But when it comes to this idea of saving ourselves pain through wisdom, that that certainly isn't the case for everything, right? I mean, we're not able to save ourselves from every kind of grief, right? We're not able to save ourselves from every kind of pain, that there's just things that happen in life that are out of our control. Maybe somebody... At work, a coworker is making your life pretty difficult right now. Or somebody said something harsh to you, somebody said something difficult, somebody said something painful to you, they offended you in some way, um, or maybe even just more generally speaking, that we go through various trials, we go through temptations, death, uh, grief that we go through that sometimes are just out of our control. And there's nothing... Nothing that we can do about it. And the reality is is that we live in a broken world that comes from living in a world that is characterized by sin. And that is the result of living in a sinful world as we live in brokenness. Whether that's financial brokenness, emotional, relational, spiritual brokenness, that pain is going to be the result of those things. And as we talked about last week, James calls out, at the beginning of chapter 5, James calls out the wealthy calls out the wealthy for the way in which they have taken advantage of the poor and the ways in which they have oppressed the poor. And he's pretty harsh with them, right? He says, weep and wail for the misery that is coming down on you. I mean, these are harsh words that James has for those those that are wealthy. But he turns his attention in verse 7 to those who have been taken advantage of. And he wants to talk to them briefly about patience. Some of, you, some of you here this morning may be saying, man, I, I really could use a good sermon on patience. Like, I was driving this last week and somebody cut me off, and man, I got so impatient, I got so angry with that person, like, man, I need to hear a, a sermon on that. Like, I would love this morning to give you a three-point sermon on this is what you should do when somebody cuts you off in traffic, but I think James has something pretty different in mind, a, a much more broader sense of patience, a much more uh, almost a bird's eye view of patience as we wait for the coming of Jesus. That what does that mean to be patient and, and wait for the coming of Jesus? How is it that we live in such a way that we live in a sinful, broken world while waiting for the Lord to return? Our culture has made the development of patience a very difficult thing to come by. I I don't suspect that that probably is a surprise to you. 
um, that our culture does very little by helping us develop patience. I think it used to be, right, if somebody said something and somebody made you mad or a company wronged you in some way, they did something wrong, what would you do? You would say, man, I am going to write them a letter. But, did, but do you remember what that meant? To say that you were going to write them a letter, you had to get the paper and you had to pull out this super heavy typewriter. You had to load the paper and get it in the right spot and type out your letter and, and pull it out and proofread it to find out that you misspelled a word. So you had to put it back in and, and white out the letter and line it up just right to put in the right letter. You know, get it out and you'd stuff it in an envelope to find out you didn't have the postage. You had to go to the post office to get a stamp. And by that time, you don't even remember why you're angry. I mean, there was just a time that lent itself more to the development of patience, pre, probably pre-technology, right? Um, but now, somebody says something, a business does you wrong, or somebody says something to you, I mean, what do we do? All it takes is about five seconds to pull out your phone and tweet something negative about that person. Then all of a sudden, the whole world knows how you feel about that person, and there's no taking it back. I saw, I saw a, a commercial probably about a year ago, um, and I find it interesting in light of what it is that we're talking about this morning. I want to show you. Check it out. Funny story, I had emailed the video that I wanted to use this morning to, uh, to Jen. Jen is the one who puts it in the projection software, that kind of thing. And, and I sent it to her. She says, emails me back. She says, I'm not getting the video that you're sending that you want me to put in a projection. I was like, what? Like, really? Like, what, you didn't get? Like, the, e the video wasn't in the email? She says, well, no, there's something there. Every time I open it up, it's just an Amazon ad. I'm not getting the video you want. And I'm like, no, that is the video. That's the video. Um, but I find it interesting, um, the assumption, or maybe, I don't know if that's the right way to say that, but the assumption that is made in that video, that the time that we take walking through a register is no longer an acceptable amount of time. Did you catch that? That I can no longer be bothered to take the few minutes it actually takes to pay for my groceries... And so we have to develop these brand new stores where I don't have to be burdened by, by the time of paying for my groceries. Or I think about Netflix. You know, the idea that I would have to endure watching a commercial that, I'll, that I'm, it's so foreign to me that I'll pay whatever I have to pay in a monthly fee just so that I can binge watch my show in a more efficient way. Y yes. <laughs> <laughs> I 
we are Netflix subscribers, if you didn't catch that. Listen, I'm not anti-technology. I am not anti-technology. All I'm saying, the only point I'm trying to make, right, is that our culture does very little for us in the development of patience. True? You with me? Amen. Amen. But, but our culture does so little. Um, the problem is, the problem is, is that there is just so many things in life, so many important things in life, whether it's marriage, whether it's parenting, whether it's your spiritual life, the development of character in your life, there are too many important things that require patience. There's too many things for us to allow our culture to define what it is that patience is, or to live in such a way that if there's any activity or anything in this culture that demands patience, then there must be something wrong with that thing, whatever it is. There's too many important things in life that require patience, that demand the development of patience in our lives. And so these readers, in verse 7, these people who have been taken advantage of, these people who have experienced injustice, these people who are going through their own sets of trials, their own difficult circumstances, the very first thing that James says to them, he says, I want you to be patient. Verse 7 says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, you too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. James uses the illustration of a farmer to drive his point home here. A farmer who works and works and works and works to plant the seed. I I don't think anybody here probably questions the work ethic of any farmer you've ever met. True? They work and they work and they work to plant that seed only to find out that they don't get a harvest right when they're done? No, they keep working, right? They keep the, they keep the machinery working. They irrigate. They're working hard, controlling insects, fighting weeds, all these kinds of things, all the while knowing that there are things that they just cannot control. They get too much rain, it's a problem. They get too little rain, it's a problem. They get a unexpected frost it's a problem that there are things regardless of how hard they work that are just out of their control and to these readers these men and women who feel as if life has been hard on them that they've been the victim victim of injustice James is saying that you have to trust God with the things that you cannot control but you need to honor me with the things that you can there are things that are going to happen to you trials, difficulties that you go through that you cannot control. But to those that you can, honor me in the things that you can. But be careful. James has a warning for us. What tends to happen when we begin to be frustrated by the things that we cannot control? I recall years and years ago taking a a group of students. I think, man, I think we were traveling from Chicago to Omaha. And we were driving on Interstate 80, and we had gotten to Des Moines. And by the time we had gotten to Des Moines, Des Moines, it was just a gigantic ice storm. And Interstate 80 was just a, was an ice rink. It was just a sheet of ice. Cars were flying off the roads everywhere. Semis were were crashing into other cars and other semis. And and of course, when that happens, everything is, is stopped. No one's going anywhere. We're just standing here in the middle of this ice storm. And Our vehicles are icing over and the roads are getting worse and worse and worse and we can't move. I believe it took us from Des Moines to Omaha, it took us a little over six hours to get home. And I am tired and I am frustrated and I am just done. I am done with this day. I just want to get home and my wife is in the passenger seat. Guess who took the brunt of that frustration? Right? James says, listen, when you're frustrated by circumstances you cannot control, do not grumble. Do not turn on each other. 
When we lose patience, we begin to grumble. What happens is, is that the focus of our life begins to change. That the focus of our life turns, turns from Christ at the center of our lives, that He's the one that I'm about, that He's the one who I, who I want to honor in all that I say, all that I, all that I do, all that I think, that, that He's the one, and our attention starts turning on myself and the ways in which I'm being wronged and what's happening to me and, and the things that are happening to me and the way that my life is being affected. It's like a, it's like a doctor that tells you, man, you've got you to gotta stop eating candy bars and you need to stop eating all that pizza. You need to stop drinking soda. You know, why? I mean, he's not, doctor's not interested in just keeping you from things that you think taste good. He's worried about the effect that it is having on you. And in the same way, James says, do not grumble. Because he wants you to know that grumbling has a toxic effect on your spiritual life. It is toxic to your growth as a Christian. Not only for yourself, but to those whom, to whom which you aim it at. But James continues, verse 10. James wants his readers to be encouraged. says, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. He wants you to be encouraged by the many examples of godly men who have experienced their own trials. Many of which... Uh, probably were just as difficult or more difficult than yours. I mean, as you think about your knowledge of the prophets, if you've ever had the opportunity to read any of the prophets, think, just think real quickly about a prophet that you might know just a little bit about. Just think of one in your head for a second. Is it safe to assume that that prophet had a pretty rough life? Is that a safe assumption? Right? That, that whoever it is that you're thinking of He had a rough life. Isaiah. God says, Isaiah, I want you to go and I want you to say to the people whatever it is that I tell you to say, but Isaiah, I'm sorry to tell you, nobody will ever listen to you ever. I want you to go. I want you to keep preaching, but nobody will ever listen to you. Jeremiah, I want you to go and I want you to tell Judah about Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's coming and he's going to take you into captivity and he's going to take all of you back to Babylon all the while. You know, God's people are saying, no, 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 God will protect us. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. But Jeremiah is saying, he's coming. And he's going to take you. And not only that, when you get there, I don't want you to grumble about it. I want you to pray for the good of that nation. I want you to work hard for the good of that nation. What is the people's response to that message? If you go back to Jeremiah 11, these people plotted to kill Jeremiah. They're like, that message is so out there and it's so unacceptable, we, this guy's got to go. Um, Hosea. God told Hosea, Hosea, I want you to marry Gomer, the prostitute. And when you marry her, she forever is going to be unfaithful to you. She's going to keep running off to other men and you're going to have to chase her down and bring her back only for her to run off to another guy for you to chase her down, bring, bring her back. Why? Because God says, I want you to know what it's like for me to be in a relationship with my people. These are hard things for God to call these people to. So for me, at face value, this doesn't seem like much of an encouragement. It seems interesting for James to say, hey, look at the prophets, right? You're having a hard time? Look at the prophets. They really had a hard time. Like, in what way is that an encouragement? But I want you to notice what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That there are others who have been through what you're going through. The prophets were an example of men who had their own unique challenges, their own difficult circumstances. They got knocked down over and over and over again. But they kept living for God. As James, put, as James puts it, they kept speaking in the name of the Lord. 
Over and over and over, they kept speaking in the name of the Lord. Paul wrote in Romans 5, For everything that was written in the past, the Old Testament Scriptures, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Through the encouragement that the Old Testament Scriptures provide that we might have hope. The stories of godly men in the Old Testament were to be a source of encouragement and hope to those who are struggling. I think that we probably ought to be spending more time in our own personal devotional time, our own personal Bible reading in the Old Testament. Reading the great stories of men and women of faith and the ways in which those stories point us to Jesus. Be encouraged. Lastly, James says that we ought to have perseverance in our trials. Verse 11 says, persevere. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. The last illustration that James uses is, is Job. The life of Job. So three really illustrations there, right? Farmer, the prophets, Job. But he says, you've heard what it is that the Lord brought about in Job. What is it? What did the Lord bring about in Job? How would you answer that question? What is it that the Lord brought about in Job? Many of you know the story. Job was a man that suffered. The Lord allowed everything to be taken from Job. He's a man who suffered financially, physically, theologically, certainly had questions about God, right? He suffered emotionally. He lost his family. He lost everything. Every area of this man's life was touched by suffering. So what is it that God brought about in Job? Just a couple of passages I want to read. As Job is arguing and defending himself, and you can turn back to Job if you want, just kind of get yourself that direction. A couple of passages I want to read. Job is arguing, he's defending himself from his friends, right? If you're familiar, Job's friends show up and, and, and pretty much accuse Job, saying, certainly, there's got to be some sort of sin in your life, Job. There's got to be things going on in your life that that's why this is happening. Job's constantly defending himself before his friends. He's defending himself before God. And if I'm going to tell you to turn to Job, I probably should do the same thing, I think. Job 13. There's, there's so many, I mean, there's so many places we could go, but there's one, there's just a couple in particular that I want to highlight for you. Um, chapter 13, verse 15. I'm going to read this in, in really two different sections. So he's defending himself before his friends, right? 15 says, Though he slay me, though God slay me, yet I will hope in him. <coughs> though God has allowed these things to happen to me in my life, my hope is squarely, firmly in the goodness of God. I, I will stay there no matter what you say. I mean, Job's wife said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die already? And Job's, Job's saying, my hope is in God. I am firmly established in God. However, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him, but, but I will surely defend my ways to his face. That's an interesting statement to me. And Job says, Yes, God has allowed these things to happen to, to me in my life. I am, I am securely planted in the goodness of God. However, God's going to hear about it. <laughs> God's going to hear about it from me. And just like the prophets, they never stop preaching, never stop preaching, never stop preaching. Job, Job never stopped praying. Never stopped praying, never stopped praying. Yes, Job had complaints, but he took those complaints to God. Job had self-pity. He took it to God. Job had doubts. 
He took it to God. He constantly kept a foot in the door. He kept the door open between him and God constantly, even if that sliver was open just so that he could yell at God for even just a moment. The door was always open. He kept praying. He kept praying. Everything that he was feeling, everything that he was going through, he was honest with God. And we might be tempted to think that the end of the story, that the end of Job's story comes at the very last few verses where we learn that God eventually restored back to Job twice what he took from him, right? Um, that maybe that's, that's the end of the story, but I sort of liken it to um, movies nowadays. If you've been you know, to a movie theater recently, you know that when the movie is over and the credits start, you know you can't leave, right? You can't leave because there's always going to be like one or two scenes that are sort of thrown into the, the extras. Anybody ever stayed around for that, right? Those extra things in the credits, I mean, that's not the end of the story. The end of the story came earlier, right? And so I, I tend to think that, that what we learn in terms of the way God resolved that situation with Job and actually giving him back and restoring his health and, and his finances and, and his family and all these kinds of things, that those are sort of postscript ideas to the actual end of the story. That the actual end um, begins in chapter 38, if you want to turn there. Um, for 37 chapters, God doesn't say anything to Job. Job doesn't know what's going on. Job was never let in on the great plan of what it was that God was doing in his life. God doesn't speak. God doesn't tell Job anything. And Job just keeps barking at God. Job just keeps saying, my hope is firmly in God, but God's going to hear about it from me. And so, chapter 38, then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. What a, what a great response here. God says, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Yikes. Man, imagine if this was you that God was saying this to. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. And here's this question. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Thirty-seven chapters of Job sort of just in the waiting of what is it that God is doing here. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what his plan is. I don't know what the end of this story is. God, tell me. And God's answer to Job, where were you when I created everything? Wow. How would you answer that question? What would you say to God in response? God says, you know everything? Where were you when I created everything? What's your response? Well, I'll tell you Job's response, chapter 42. God just keeps laying into Job a little bit for a few chapters. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is it that obscures my plans without knowledge? Here's his answer. He says, surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. But here it is, verse 5. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. What is it that James says that God brought about in Job? God brought about in Job heart change. His heart was changed towards God. That's what God brought about in Job. Not a return of his physical possessions, not his health, not his family, none of those things. That's not what God brought about. What it is that God changed Job's life. Job met God in a brand new way as he waited for God to do whatever it was that he was going to do. Just like a farmer, if we're going to go back to that illustration, 
just like a farmer who waits for that day, who waits for that harvest, that day that's out there. For Job, that day that was out there in which God was going to do whatever it was that he was going to do, that that day was not the thing that God was trying to bring about in, in Job. It was what God was doing in Job as he waited for God to do whatever it is that God was going to do. Are you following me? That God wasn't having Job wait simply until God made everything right, but that God was in work as he waited. And that's the point. That the context of patience, as James uses it, is so much more than just, man, somebody cut me off in traffic. But it is the waiting, it is the patience necessary to live in a sinful world as we wait for the Lord to return. That there's a day coming, an unknown day, and we wait. That the pain that we experience in the waiting the grief, the tears, the challenges, that someday Jesus is coming again. And in that day, in that harvest day, no more grief, no more pain, no more tears. But I think what he wants us to know is that while we wait for that day, that he's at work in the waiting In our hearts, in our lives, in our relationships, God is at work in the waiting. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, whatever it is this morning that we come with that has us discouraged, that has us down, that has us struggling, Lord, as Job said, our, our trust, our hope is in you. Father, we recognize this morning that, that you are at work in the waiting for you to do whatever it is that you're going to do. Lord, help us to see the ways in which you are trying to shape us in the waiting, that you are trying to shape us into the likeness of your son Jesus. Lord, I, we just thank you this morning. We thank you for the examples of men and women from Scripture who are an encouragement, who are a source of hope for us. And ultimately, Lord God, we thank you for the, for the truth of your word this morning. Lord, we trust that you would use it for your honor and for your glory today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction. How many, how many here need patience today? Let's see if my mic is working. Here we go. How many here need to pray for patience? Patience. That's what makes a family. That's what makes a church. Is be patient with one another, patient with God, patient in our suffering. Father, as we leave, help us, Lord, to be patient with ourselves, with others, even with you. I pray that the Holy Spirit would come upon us and grant us this gift of patience. We know it's from your Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's how we express love to one another. It's what community is all about. Lord, help us not to grumble against each other. Help us, Father, to patiently love you and one another thank you for this time together we bless your name christ's name amen three announcements quickly 21 days of prayer got one more week we've had wonderful times of prayer 